Welcome artistic friends, visitors, and subscribers to Monet Cafe. I'm so glad you're with me today. This lesson is the second part in a beginner series, and this one's called A Roadmap for Painting. In the first video of the beginner series, right before this one, I focused on creating a value study, or called a NOTAN, which is an excellent way to begin a painting and to make sure you get composition and values correct. Now, in today's video, we'll take that a step further as we create what I like to call a roadmap for successful painting. So stay tuned, and I'll be sharing all of those nice little painting secrets and tips. Oh, first, if you'd like a happy painting t-shirt, just click the link below the description section of this video and use the promo code ARTISTIC before August 15th, 2019 to get 10% off. All right, now I'd like to go over a supply list. The surface I'll be using for today's painting is on UART sanded paper and it's 400 grit and I'm using the pads it's uh, or 10 sheets in a pack, 9 by 12 sheets and I do cut them smaller. In this case I'm doing an 8 inch by 6 inch painting. But I have other videos where I share alternate methods of creating your own sanded pastel surface so be sure to check out the other videos. Now the product I'll be using for the second part in this beginner series or the roadmap to a successful painting is a product that I'm using as an underpainting. And I just discovered this neat new technique that uses watercolor pencils. Now you don't have to use watercolor pencils for this particular part of the lesson. You can use alternate mediums and I will be discussing that as the lesson goes along. And I'll be using various types of pastels, but I wanted to go ahead and go over some of the ones I recommend as really good for beginners. I happen to have a set of Giro pastels that I recently purchased, and I love these pastels because they are not too hard and not too soft. Uh, they're really a great product uh, for working as a beginner. Another pastel I recommend for beginners is Mount Vision Pastel. This particular picture is of their landscape set, 50 of them. And pastels can get expensive, and I think this is a pretty good value. You, they're a very large pastel, and um, I like the fact that they, again, are not too hard or too soft. Another beginner set I would recommend is Rembrandt Pastels. Whenever you can, as a beginner, try to get half sticks. These come in half sticks. You get double the color for the same money. Rembrandt is, I would say, harder than all of the ones I've mentioned before, but it's a really good way to start. They're a little bit more reasonable than some of the other more expensive ones. Now, don't get overwhelmed. I know we all want a pastel box that looks like this, but you got to start somewhere, right? So um, just kind of start where you can and gradually build up as you can afford it. Now for this particular painting, I'm using a piece of UART 400 grit sanded pastel paper and I have the piece I've cut from the 9 by 12 sheets in that pack and this is an 8 inch by 6 inch piece. I use standard sizes often because you can find frames without having to get custom made frames and your clients sometimes may like that. And here I'm just basically sketching in the composition. You can use really whatever you want. I'm using one of the watercolor pencils that I'll be talking about. Um, but keep a light touch with this. And in a minute you'll see I actually put up from lesson number one, where we talked about simple beginnings, I put the actual value study that we did before, or the NOTAN it's called, underneath my reference image. And that's the point of this. I, I kind of forgot, I just started sketching. And then I go ahead and add the little notan. But this part is basically just your simple little sketch. In part one of the lesson, we kind of worked out our composition, making sure you know we like where we're headed with this. And um, we have a little value roadmap um, before we even get to this next roadmap that I'll be working on in this painting. And I'm gonna try to keep this one real time. Um, as much as possible. I know that helps you, especially um, when you're a beginner. And uh, also, I am very blessed now that I got a new computer. I got a new MacBook Pro. My other MacBook Pro I had had for a while. I actually tried to save money buying a, a used one many years ago. And I've been repairing it and, and making that, that sweet old hardworking computer work a long time for me. But it finally bit the dust the other day. It was at an inopportune time. When is it not <laughs> when those things happen? But you know, I totally believe that blessings can come out of uh, tragic circumstances. That's happened time and time again in my life. And um, so I've learned as I've gotten older, just to hang in there and wait for the Lord's blessing. And 
Now, uh, with everything I went through to try to get it restored, the wonderful thing is that now my processing speed is faster. I'm able to do real time more. So I'm going to benefit from that and you're going to benefit from that too as viewers um, and uh, just uh, students trying to learn more about getting better. So as you can see, when you see real time, you can see I am taking my time. Sometimes I really sketch quickly um, if I'm just doing a little study. But in this particular case, I'm taking my time. I'm creating just really light strokes here. And uh, I'm trying to get the things in the image that I remembered that I liked. And that's a really poor, important part about painting process. Sometimes I know as beginners, it can be a little overwhelming is to think, okay, first of all, I gotta find an image. And I've had times in the past as a beginner artist where I literally spent hours just searching for an image that inspired me or you know made me feel like, oh, this is the one. And often you waste your precious creative um, uh, time or energy in uh, kind of getting discouraged and bogged down with the whole looking for an image process. So I encourage you to, if you're going to do that, take a couple of hours. Uh, I've talked about some of the, get your own photos when you can. Okay, there is, I'm putting up now the little um, no tan or value study that I did in the previous lesson. And that is going to be my guide for creating the rest of this painting. But as I was saying before, try to get some reference images at your fingertips. The more quickly you can grab something to paint from, the better. And also don't get so fussy about what it is. When you're beginning, just paint. Grab something and start painting. We often try too hard to create a masterpiece early on when we just need to practice. All right, now I'm going to show you a little bit closer these Arteza um, Artist Quality uh, Watercolor Pencils. Now, I am using these products. If you've seen some of my other videos, they keep sending me products, which is great of them. Some of them I've pulled out. I've actually been using them, but they actually are in three layers. There's 72 pencils. Well, I goofed off with them the other day when they sent me a set. I played with different things on watercolor paper, and then I thought, hmm, let me try these on sanded paper. And oh my goodness, I absolutely loved them as for creating an underpainting. And that's what I'd like to say is the roadmap. This is part two that we're talking about. We've created the value study. Sorry for my shaky easel there. And um, we've got our good bones for the painting. That's what I kind of call the value study. Now we're going to create a roadmap which is an underpainting. I've got a lot of videos that talk about underpainting. I've got a lot of different underpainting techniques, but in this particular beginner video, I wanted to kind of go over the nuts and bolts of it and, and help you guys in understanding not just how to do it, but more why to do it. All right, so as I'm still sketching here, I'll talk a little bit more about the underpainting. Now, you do not have to use the watercolor pencils that you're going to see me use you can use whatever medium will get color down in mass or in in big shapes um, that works for you i have multiple videos on underpaintings and how to do them if you have watercolor and they don't even have to be expensive watercolor fortunately this uart paper takes water it water does not hurt this paper this is a great paper um, so you can use watercolor in place of the watercolor pencils that you'll see me using you can use pastels if you don't have any of those things you can have take some of your pastels and use some of the colors that i'll recommend just kind of lay them on their side and you're going to create big areas of color and um, i'll tell you how you can blend those in even without water you can use water with pastels to blend them in or you can just scrub them and blend them in with other tools okay so i'll try to remember to talk about that but now i'm still just getting the sketch in and um, that value study is helping me with the sketch. I mean, I could do the sketch without it there. You see, I started it like that, but that value study is what's really going to help me once I get to the underpainting process, okay? And even throughout the rest of the painting. So that's why I'm calling this um, step one is to create the good bones, a simple beginning, which is the no tan or the value study. Step two is to create a roadmap or an underpainting for a successful painting. Now, you don't always have to do an underpainting, but you know, I think I pretty much always do an underpainting of sorts, okay? There's, like I said, there's so many different ways to do it, but I like to cover up that 
very, in this case, it's a cream colored paper, but you want to get that paper covered. Um, and there's multiple reasons for that. One of them is I like to get a color underneath the painting that's going to complement or uh, make the colors that I choose more beautiful for the painting. Now pardon this jumping ahead a bit. I had my big old head in the way and you couldn't see what I was doing. Right now all I've done is I got a little bit of a, a harder pastel. In this case it's called a new pastel, in you pastel. But I'm just getting some darks in where those trees are. It's kind of kind of help me see where things are before I get to the underpainting part. All right, I've just put the trees in. So get a darker pastel or something and kind of just get some of your shapes in there to, to know where you're going. Now, I've got another new pastel, just a little harder pastel, and I'm keeping a very light touch. But all I'm really working on here is I've kind of emulating the value study that I did. I'm looking at my value study. I'm also looking at the reference photo and I'm, I've got a super soft touch here. I don't want to fill up, you know, the tooth of the paper and um, I'm keeping it so loose. This under part of your painting, keeping it loose is very important. And I skipped ahead a bit here. I apologize. I got my big head in the way again. I've got to remember to pull my hair back when I do these videos. Um, but as you can see, I am emulating the notan or the value study and just getting in big shapes um, filling in uh, pretty much the goal is I'm going to get color everywhere and now I believe in a second I'm going to start using the actual watercolor pencils again I could have used the watercolor pencils for all of this I just happen to have a couple of darker new pastels right near me all right this is a darker I think this color is called amethyst Again, you can use whatever you have. You can um, totally go back and look at some of my videos where I just do a watercolor underpainting. But this I found very neat using these watercolor pencils. I like to sketch and um, you may have a little more control over the watercolor pencil at first over where things are than you would over watercolor if you're not used to mediums with a brush. Um, I, I absolutely love this. I will definitely use this technique again. I don't even think you would have to have very expensive watercolor pencils. Um, I do like to try to encourage if you're going to get, if, if you're just practicing and you're brand new, just use whatever. You know, I've thrown away, I'd say, uh, the majority of my beginner work. I think all of it. As you grow as an artist, you end up getting rid of your work from early on. So it's okay if you can't afford the most expensive supplies, if your um, supplies are, are not acid free, it's called, or archi archival. Um, but as you grow as an artist, you want to try to get supplies that are um, archival, that don't have acid in them, that they're going to last over time. So that if a client buys your painting, you want to make sure, you know, it's going to last. They're not going to um, have it for a while and it yellow or anything like that. Um, so uh, again, I'm using these watercolor pencils now and I'm just sketching in. I'm focusing on the value, which means the lightness or the darkness of the color more than the color. But if, and the lightness or the darkness is the reason for that, that value study that you see at the right beneath. Okay, it's just really where are the lights and darks and the no tan is to create a pleasing composition of the lights and darks. I'd say that's one of the most important things about your whole painting. Is this going to be a pleasing composition to look at? I mean, it doesn't matter how much detail or, or vibrant color you have if you don't have a nice composition to begin with. And again, don't be too hard on yourself. These things get better in time. Go ahead and plan on throwing away a lot of your paintings. And when you have that attitude when you start with and you don't expect yourself to be a master artist right away, then you're going to have a lot more fun. Now, um, the second part of what I was going to say is I'm focusing more on value than color. But if I had to say what color I'm focusing on, I'm focusing more on warm colors in this. It is really beautiful for your final painting, especially if you've got a lot of greens, if it's a landscape. Uh, now, I didn't have to use a green here. It's just kind of put it in because there's a vibrant green in the background. But it's really nice if you can lay down colors that are on the opposite side of the color wheel from green. And in this case, it would be the warmer colors, the oranges, the reds, and the yellows. And it really makes your painting pop when you kind of see through those undertones of reds, even pinks, you know. So I'm going to have most of this, with the exception of this green here, um, in the warm uh 
color and even this is a warmer green than a cooler green so that I would say with this second part of the painting after you've got your value study we're getting down and under painting we're focusing on the value the lighter dark more than the color but if you would like to I encourage to create a warm underpainting all of these colors this one I'm using here is a warm color it's a red now notice this red that I'm using it's darker you know than say the yellow that I put down underneath before up there and the reason is it's in the shadow and it's um, in the foreground and if you look at the if you squint I encourage squint a whole lot if you squint your eyes and look at the reference photo you can see that the foreground the part in the front even though it's lighter than what's in the shadow it's a lot darker than that strip of light behind the trees so um, that's why I use the red in the foreground now I'm right now I'm putting some of the red in the background because some of those trees are darker in the background so I'm gonna let that red dark value be my dark value now I'm getting down it's a little bit lighter it's like an orange color and I'm getting that down that's gonna combine kind of nicely with that red but what's neat about this uh, oranges and reds and yellows especially in the foreground here is when you look at the ground or the grass we have a tendency in our brain to go oh that's green and we don't think about the fact that there's a whole play of color going on the the grass is on top of the ground there is earth and dirt underneath there and it just creates a nice foundation or um or a uh, uh, almost like the dirt underneath the grass so it really is a nice color to use as an underpainting and again I'm using that orange in the background because there are some darker shadowy values in the trees but it's not as dark as those foreground trees you'll see I darken that up um, now I'm using that yellow um, and I actually could have used that yellow as a whole instead of any of that green but I'm using that yellow it's my lightest value if you squint your eyes and look at the reference photo what's the lightest thing in the photo it's that grass that the Sun is shining on in this case you see we don't have any sky typically the sky is the lightest thing there's no sky if you and that's the cool thing about doing that value study beneath is we've already established that you already see behind those trees that's where that strip of grass is now for the fun part I'm using some alcohol this is just alcohol you get at Walgreens I know they have different percentage alcohols this one's 91 percent I haven't really found that it matters all that much um, now I have to remember not to drink that out of that coffee cup <laughs> which I don't fortunately but um, I'm just gonna get a medium-sized brush I find use the biggest brush that you can um, because it's gonna help create looseness instead of getting so fussy and tight in the painting I keep a paper towel handy and I use that just if I sometimes if I have too much of the alcohol on my brush um, there's a lot on it here and it just starts kind of dripping which is fine let it drip okay but if you think it's gonna drip too much and it's gonna just lighten up all the dark values you just laid down you just blot it on your paper towel a little bit now first I'm focusing on the darks I want to get sometimes I do the value study uh, or the underpainting and I don't put any of the darks in until after I get the reds oranges and yellows down and that's actually kind of a good idea too because if you're not used to doing this that way you don't get your your darks and your lights all blending together you know if you're not used to using the brush so um, you can do the darks after if you would like as well all right so I'm just getting the trees all in here and um, again I'm just using the alcohol by the way you don't have to use alcohol you can use water water would work the same way it just uh, doesn't dry quite as quickly as the alcohol and uh, I don't know I, I kind of find the alcohol it behaves a little differently with the alcohol than the the water I think so anyway that might just be me okay so getting in those dark trees now one thing that is important and I'm gonna end up darkening those trees again this again is a road map think of this this is not the final painting this is just getting down that guide and that nice warm undercolor um, to, to have a guide to have a road map for your painting now you see I'm kind of working those background trees you see how those reds and oranges are kind of blending together and then I've got some of those purpley colors kind of in there and um, I'm not getting all fussy with it I'm focusing on the value and notice I'm making my strokes kind of just go up and down I feel like those trees are kind of doing that later I'm gonna add pastels on top of that now again this is uh, or I should stress that 
Keep in mind, things that are further away, like these trees, they get lighter in value. Again, squint your eyes, look at that reference photo. Those foreground trees, especially that mass of something that's over to the right, are the darkest thing. Those background trees, they're the same kind of trees, and if you walked up close to them, they'd be dark too, like the ones in the foreground. But when things are in the distance, the atmosphere gets in the way. That's why mountains in the distance look purple or blue. They're not purple or blue. It's all the sky and all the atmosphere that's in between you and that. So they lighten in value, they get lighter, and they cool off. Okay, now I've got a warm undercolor, I'm mean, warm, warm underpainting here, so they're not cool yet, but I'm going to cool things off with the pastels that I lay on top of it. But now you see that um, mass that I did right behind the tree? That is the darkest thing in the painting, whatever it is, a bush or something. And when I paint, I try to forget what things are, and I just look at the shapes. Um, it really helps uh, get you out of the tendency to get detail too quickly. Just consider yourself, I'm painting a mass or a shape. Now I know I've got a pretty decent shadow going on under those trees, and I'm also, notice I'm painting directionally. I feel like those shadows are sweeping across from right to left, so, and even the ground. That's why I'm making my strokes in a directional path. And uh, that gives your painting a sense of movement. And um, I don't know, it's just kind of fun for me to try to follow the way the land is flowing. And it's okay if this is a little bit messy. I notice I'm, some spots aren't even totally painted in. Um, and that adds to that real painterly look, that Im impressionistic look, which I know a lot of people in our group really like. That's how I lean. I appreciate and love very realistic paintings, but I don't know, I'm just drawn to the ones that are just loose and almost feel like a dream. Um, now I'm just getting in. See, I had some of that little uh, magenta purple back there. It's probably, no, it's actually a little another little section of bushes that are lighter because they're further away. Um, so fine-tuning this a little bit, you may have noticed I left a little strip of white in between, behind the trees and in between the, the really bright yellowy green grasses. And it's because um, when I was closer up at the reference photo, I could tell there was some sort of, well, I know there's some sort of road there because it's my road. <laughs> it's a little gravel road on a, a property that um, we actually were living on um, for a while after the flooding of our home. And um, uh, it's a pretty tiny house, so we're, we're living in a, a different house now. But, um, but anyway, so, okay, getting this finished up. And now, this is what I was saying. The point of this lesson is the roadmap to the painting. Step one was a simple beginning, the notan or the uh, value study it's called. Part two was getting a roadmap, and it's basically just the under part of your painting. Now I wanted to show you this real quickly. This is where I just experimented with the watercolor pencils and I got real sketchy and loose with it. I was just having fun. And I wish I had stayed that sketchy and loose with this one. But I wanted to point that out because that's what I encourage is to uh, just keep your strokes really loose, fun, and free. Also, in that little example I just showed, if you remember seeing it, it didn't have the darks in it yet, which is really kind of a neat way to begin as well. There's so many different ways and possibilities that we can do this. All right, now is where I will begin the painting. The underpainting part or the road map to start the rest of the painting is done. I'm showing that little cigar cutter. Uh, it's an excellent little way to cut your pastels, um, especially the round ones if they fit in that. Those, those are my uh, Giro pastels and I, I, like, I like them in smaller sizes than the long sticks so I was cutting it. So now is we've got our road map done. Okay, that was the point of this second beginner series video. But I want to go ahead and go through this painting. Um, and uh, give you as much information as I can because I know you guys have hungry artistic minds. <laughs> so what I'm doing now is I'm reinforcing those darks. Even though I kind of put them in where they were um, it, from the value study, um, notice they weren't really dark until when I start putting this down and you say, wow, okay, they, they weren't that dark when you did the underpainting. So I'm just reinforcing the darkest darks in this and uh, getting things re-established, so to speak. And again, this underpainting is my roadmap. Because I put it in, I don't have to focus on so much on where does this tree go? Where does that tree go? What value is it? Because I've already got, if you notice in the underpainting, I know what my darkest darks are. They're those foreground trees. 
I know what my next darks are. Those are those shadows in the foreground and the foreground. I know what my next value is. I would say the third in darkness. That would be the background trees. I know what my lighter values are. That would be those bright grasses in the back. And my lightest value would be that road. Okay, so I've really got four values going on here. Gosh, my poor easel. I'm always hitting it. I gotta get away to be more stable. All right, so now again, I've got my roadmap. I already know there's a beautiful um, warm light value green going on back there. And I'm getting that in. A lot of times I like to get my darkest dark in and my lightest light. And then I know, okay, this is where the rest of my values need to fall in between those two. I've had a tendency sometimes to get a value too light or too dark too quickly. So if you get that in right away, it kind of helps you work from the far extremes down uh, to the middle values. And I'm keeping a light touch here. I'm laying it on its side. I see a little bit of that green is kind of peeking through. If you look at the reference photo, just a little bit of it is going behind that tree. Oh, and also, feel free to use this reference image if you like. I have been creating little clickable um, URLs in my description section. I'll try to remember to put this particular reference photo in it um, so that you can click it and use this actual reference photo to paint from if you'd like to just go along with this video. And I realize we all have different supplies, so just do the best you can. I was pointing out there, my next darkest value is, oh, I'm using my little cutter, is are those background trees okay um, and I'm using notice I've got my warmer underpainting back there it's kind of a purpley magenta and some oranges back there and now I'm gonna cool them off I'm gonna layer on top of them with this cooler medium value this is not a real dark value it's kind of a medium value pastel and I'm, I'm constantly kind of measuring and looking if I have a mistake or something um, and I think it probably helps you guys when I do have real time because you can see I do get purposeful at times and sometimes if I speed up the videos it looks like I'm oh she's just so good she just never has to measure it or anything oh yeah I do <laughs> um, but now notice how when I add this really pretty blue on top of those um, magenta colors do you see how that color is kind of uh, exciting and vibrating and um, if you squint your eyes as I'm doing this they, they start to look like background trees, okay? You're not getting in a lot of detail. That's another thing that happens when things recede in the distance. They get lighter in value, they get cooler in color, and they get uh, less detailed, okay? Foreground is gonna get darker in value, bolder in color, and more detail. But while I have that blue, often I will um, try to maximize the pastel while I have it in my hand. I know that those shadows under the trees are gonna be cooler in temperature. Things in the shadows are almost always cooler always cooler really and cooler means blues purples um, just that side of the color wheel and um, so I'm just laying down on top of that that uh, ground that I've created with the warmer colors I'm laying down some of those cooler blues and uh, some of that little bit of a darker value if you squint your eyes and look at the reference photo again if you look at the shadow, especially the left side of the shadow, under those trees, the left side um, is not as dark as the right side of the shadow. But if you look at the left side of that shadow, squint your eyes and look at the background trees, they're almost the same value. Okay, so that's why I used that same blue. Um, now I'm just getting in a little bit more. I'm establishing um, the um, actual drawing or where things are a little bit more precisely with my strokes now. And uh, you see now how adding that green, doesn't that, that painting already looks more exciting than if I hadn't put that underpainting down. What if I had just used all greens and blues in this? Um, that magenta and orange and red and yellow just makes things more exciting. Now what I'm doing here, I'm using the little edge of the pastel there on the circular part to create, if, you can't see the reference photo real close here, but there's little um, sections in the, it's almost like that road goes way back into a forest kind of meandering around and light is hitting um, in between trees in the background there so I'm just getting a little bit of that in not super precisely yet but just to remind me that it's there okay now I'm starting notice my strokes um, I'm going from a transition of horizontal strokes well I'm quitting now but to vertical horizontal stroke are usually the strokes you use 
in the backgrounds as things recede. We don't see grasses growing straight up and down as much uh, when they're far away. We see it more when they are close up. Um, now I know that little area that's peeking through back there where the sun was hitting, it's not quite as bright in a green as those that other light light green I used. Now I'm just kind of glazing that over. I know there is some green there. I mean I can see there is green, but that green is so much more interesting and exciting now as I'm just taking the side of the pastel and just kind of glazing it over. Keep your strokes really really soft and gentle at this point um, so that you know you can correct things if you need to later rather than really pressing down real hard with that pastel. So uh, I'm putting, just before this, I put a little bit more of that blue down beside those trees. I could see the earth was kind of growing up around them and there was a little bit more shadowy there. And uh, I noticed too, it's a little bit just darker in general around the bases of the trees. Typically that's the way it is. I see that the shadow now I'm correcting a little bit goes out a little further up on the left side of the trees and then I had originally drawn it in. Um, again, I really apologize for my easel shaking so much. Now, back to where I was talking about vertical strokes. Now, I'm starting to work my pastels a little more vertically because I know grass is kind of growing that direction. I'm still keeping a super, super light touch um, just in case I want to kind of change direction with some of the things I want to do. But can you see now, if you squint your eyes, can you see already the painting is starting to take shape? And really, at this point in the video, I don't know, what am I, 30 minutes into the video? Um, that's, that's the only time it has taken me. Uh, now, I did create the value study, all right? Um, but the underpainting and to this point was only 30 minutes, okay? So that's not a long time to kind of get the, um, the direction of your painting and already start to see it take shape. I happen to love, uh, as I said before, really impressionistic things. And sometimes I look back at my videos, I'm like, man, I could have just done a little bit more on this painting and left it. But I don't know, that might be a little too rough for some people's taste. It, the trees do need some, some uh, branches and leaves on them because there are some of those up at the top. But, but I really like the, the play of color that's happening here. And so, um, again, that's the, the main point of this part of the video was to help you understand that you're creating a base to work from and um, once you get that down your painting just has a, a much better direction to go and you, it actually makes your painting easier when you do these steps rather than just jump right in and start painting on a blank piece of paper now I love this particular purpley blue color what is that like a it's not quite it's more purple than a periwinkle blue but see how cool that is man that really pushed those trees back squint your eyes you just see them they look like they're far away now, while I have this one in my hand, I'm going to see if there's anywhere else I could use that particular value. And um, I think, yeah, some of those little shadowy areas that are cooler, um, it's just going to have a nice little harmony. Now, that's another reason, too, I wanted to mention that I um, keep a certain pastel. If I've used it in one place, I see if there's somewhere else I can use it because it creates a harmony in your painting. I even do that with the sky. You know, skies are typically blue, grass is green, trees, leaves are green. Um, but I'll often, even in clouds and in the sky, I try to carry some of the colors in the land up into the sky because it, it makes your painting just um, um, blend better and feel better. It feels more cohesive and rather than having a, a, a separation between the land and the sky. I hope that makes sense. Now I'm using this lighter pastel just to get in the road here and um, an indication of kind of that lighter road and that's going to be the lightest thing in the painting. Okay so I'm going to keep this real time but I'm going to add some music and let you guys just watch the process and if you decide to join along with me just um, click the link in this video to see the reference photo, print it out and um, hopefully learn a whole lot from this beginner series. I am excited to see some of your comments that you are excited about me really focusing on beginner lessons. Um, I always say my heart is for the beginner because I had such a struggle early on. I couldn't have, not only couldn't afford uh, to go to workshops or anything outside of the home, um, I didn't have the time. So I love being able to give this to you guys and help you guys out. And um, I really, really hope you're benefiting from it. So. Uh, be sure to comment, like the video. Those things do help me. I share often that um, 
my heart is to try to keep these lessons free as long as I can. I mean, maybe in the future I'll have a Patreon account where I give more advanced lessons, but I always want to try to have good beginner lessons on here, and uh, it does help me out. Um, if you guys like, share, comment, um, it does send my, what happens is it sends my um, rating up in YouTube to where when people look for pastel lessons, mine comes up, you know, and I, I hope they're of value, so I hope that happens. <laughs> so uh, I appreciate your help with that. And uh, all right, guys, enjoy the rest of this video, and I will come back and talk to you guys in a minute.
wrapping it up at this point I do a little bit more on it to finish it up but um, I wanted to just say I really hope these are helping I do have more on the way the next video is actually going to be a bit of this same technique but as I mentioned about in the middle of the video um, how I wished I had not added the dark um, at the beginning and just did the underpainting with the watercolor pencils well that's what I'm gonna do on the next video and I think you'll see it really does give a a neat impressionistic sketchy colorful effect and um, so join me for the next beginner series episode a little bit more of the roadmap to painting and uh, I'm so excited you've joined me here in Monet Cafe I pray your artistic life is blessed and beautiful Thanks so much, guys. Happy painting.